Food microbiology is um, a two unit course, STM 3 to 4. STM 3 to 4. And this course is a pericocyte to industrial microbiology. That means that when you fail this course, you will not be able to register for your industrial microbiology in HND2 first semester. I'm going to try my best to make it as simple as, and straightforward so that um, everyone will pass in flying colors. The course has um, eight modules, eight modules. And um, the first module is, we are going to be discussing sources of microbial contamination in food sources of microbial contamination in food. How does our food get contaminated? What are the sources through which this food can be contaminated? We're going to be identifying some sources, air, water, soil, plants, humans, equipment, products, ingredients, you know, packaging materials. How does these sources become sources i mean become um, a point of contamination in food that's going to be our first module and under that first module we are going to see the role of um, soil microorganisms in agriculture how do they improve the soil fertility how do they add to the soil in order to improve yield we're also going to be looking at um, water. What are those microorganisms that are in water that can be a source of contamination to food? And a major group will be discussed under these, and that's the group called um, the family Enterobacteriaceae. Their importance in water, and we're going to be discussing that also. We're also going to explain how plants and animals could serve as um, sources of microbial contamination. We are going to be explaining how humans can serve as sources of contamination, you know, equipment, food products, that's cross-contamination. Then we are going to be, um, there's going to be practical on this where you are going to be um, exposed to some of these, um, some of these um, tests, for example, for air, you want to confirm if organisms are in air. I'm going to show you how um, water can be a source of contamination to food in the laboratory. And um, we're also going to be screening water for coliform. That's the family Enterobacteriaceae, and I said, earlier that they are, they are very significant in water quality control. The second model will be talking about um, factors that affect microbial growth in food. Now, organisms are in food, but there are some certain factors that will affect their growth, either factors that are detrimental to them or factors that improve their growth in food. And before that, we're going to also be discussing the microbial growth curve. What happens in, in, um, in the growth curve? What happens in the growth curve? A microbial growth curve will only um, take place, the four phases of microbial growth, which is the lag phase, the log phase, exponential phase, and the stationary phase, will only happen in a closed system and that's what we call a batch culture but there's there's another type of culture that is called a continuous culture and that will not go through the four phases it either stops at the stationary phase or at the exponential phase depending on your target um, metabolites now some factors affect the growth of microorganisms in food and this can be divided into chemical factors, physical factors, and biotic factors. Under chemical factors, we have um, 
things like nutrients, pH, redox potential, the presence of antimicrobial agents. We're going to be discussing how these factors affect the growth of microorganisms in food. Then under physical factor, we shall be discussing temperature, water activity, relative humidity, and biological structure. While the biotic factor has to do with the growth rate, metabolism, and antagonism. These factors affect the growth of microorganisms in food, and we are going to deal with them extensively. Module three will be discussing the techniques for the study of microorganisms. How do you study microorganisms in food? Okay, we now know that there are microorganisms in food because basically there's no food that is sterile. Now, how do you determine their presence in food? And that's what we mean by the technique of, for study of microorganisms. Here we're going to be dealing with isolation, cultivation, um, isolation methods such as cereal dilution, spread plate method, power plate method, streaking. We're going to be discussing the colony forming units. There's going to be a calculation under that. How, did, how do you determine your colony forming unit per sample? And um, under that, is also going to be the practical section where serial dilution will be carried out, culturing will be done, isolation and identification of the isolates will also be done. And under that, we are going to be preparing pure cultures. We're going to carry out gram staining, spore staining, capsule staining, and any other staining that is um, relevant. Module four will be discussing microbial, microbiological study of specific foods. Microbiological study of specific foods. And that's a bit of a long module because under that we shall be discussing um, non-useful functions of microorganisms in food. Non-useful functions, that means, what do they do? They are, um, detrimental effect on food. And under that, we shall be discussing food spoilage and food borne diseases. Food spoilage and food borne diseases. That's the non-useful function of microorganisms in food. Under that, we are also going to discuss useful functions of microorganisms in food. Useful functions of microorganisms in food. And there we shall be discussing processing, preservation, you know, processing, preservation. And we're also going to be identifying microbial agents that are associated with the spoilage of different products, meat and meat products, poultry products, milk and dairy products, baked foods and confectionaries, fruits and vegetables, canned foods, dried foods, fish and seafood, cereal and cereal products. We're going to be discussing their, the microbial spoilage pattern, describing their storage conditions, as well as describe the useful functions of microorganisms in these products. And module five has to do with the microbial foodborne diseases microbial food borne diseases. And under that, we shall be dis differentiating between food poisoning and food infection. Foodborne illnesses caused by bacteria, parasites, viruses, protozoas, and the, the implication of these organisms in response to foodborne diseases. We're going to be discussing foodborne outbreak. What is an outbreak? How does um, these organisms get, um, how do they get established in the system of their host? You know, we're going to be discussing all that. Okay, there's also a practical under that. Are you going to isolate and culture organisms responsible for food poisoning? Food poisoning, 
meant to isolate spoiled food and actually screen them for the presence of some metabolites. And the last model, which is the model eight, we shall be discussing indices of food plant sanitation. Indices of food plant sanitation, microbiological standards and criteria for setting up a food production premise. We want to set up a food production lab as a food microbiologist. What are the things that should be considered in building a food factory? Do you understand? The design of the plants and um, the sites. What are the things to consider when choosing the sites? The personnel, you know, all this shall be discussed. Then I'm um, going to be explaining the in indices and criteria for examining microbial sanitation, status of food production. So it's going to be an interesting class. It's going to be an interesting class. I, I'll be taking this course with Mrs. Collade. Mrs. Collade, I'm actually going to add her to the group so that um, I'll be taking four modules and she'll be taking the other three modules. But let me just start with the introduction. As time goes on, you get to meet us. Now, for my class, what I do at the end of every module or every class, since it's online, you will go to the classroom, which I believe that everyone has registered. You go to the classroom, Google Classroom, and answer a quiz. And that's what is going to be cumulated for my test, for your test call. So make sure that I'm going to set a time. I'm sure you are familiar with that on how to do that. So at the end of every lecture, we shall have a short quiz. So the introduction of the course, Food Microbiology. You all know what microorganisms are. They are organisms that are too tiny to be seen with the naked eyes. And food is what we eat to give us energy, what we eat or drink in order to give us energy. Now, basically, the food that we eat, they are not sterile. There's nothing like sterile food, just like there's nothing like pure water. We'll just give it a name, pure, pure, pure. But in that water, we have um, saprophytes, non-pathogens. Pathogens are disease-causing organisms. Non-pathogens, they are non-disease-causing organisms. Saprophytes are free-living free -living organisms that do not cause disease. They derive nutrients from the food. You know, they derive nutrients from the food which they inhabit. But the major concern about food or water is for the fact that we don't want pathogens, disease-causing organisms to be in the food. So basically, there are microbial associations whose composition depend upon which organism gain access and how they grow, survive, and interact in the food over time. So just like in animal kingdom, the survival of the fittest. It also happens within the food um, environment. Organisms try to enter into the food, gain access into the food. While they do that, the food now serves as substrate for them, you know, substrates in the, that they derive their own um, nutrients from the food. And as they grow, they begin to spoil the food. How? by releasing metabolites into this food. Metabolites, enzymes, chemicals, waste products, which now make the food to be spoiled. Now, while the organisms are doing that, the food composition also has their own strategy. You know, they also have things within them that fights against these evading microorganisms in order for them 
not to be destroyed. This also happens in animals. Human beings, for example. There's nothing like a sterile human being. In different parts of our body, we have microorganisms in them that are called the normal flora. If you like, use toothpaste from heaven to wash your mouth. You cannot remove the microorganisms that are in the mouth. They aid in digestion and they also aid in keeping that environment the way it is. I'm not talking about people with mouth odor. That's another condition anyway. In our GIT, the gastrointestinal tract, we have um, microorganisms that are normal flora in there, keeping that part very healthy, except for the stomach, because of the stomach acid, the acid in the stomach. But recently we have discovered that even the stomach can inhabit bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, as a causative agent for, for ulcer, gastric ulcer. Now, in, uh, on our skin, we also have microflora, normal flora on the skin. So I'm just trying to tell you that just like plants are not sterile, they have their own inherent flora, microflora in them. So also, animals, humans are not sterile. Now, in most cases, the microflora in the food, they have no discernible effects. And the food is consumed without objection and with no adverse consequences. So basically, when you want to eat, you don't need a microscope to now look into your food to see whether, ah, let me use microscope to check whether there's microorganisms in the food. No, once the food is well cooked, you know, properly prepared. We just eat without objection. And most times, no adverse consequence. But in some instances, microorganisms manifest their presence in several ways. And that's by causing, you know, they can cause food spoilage, they can cause foodborne illness, and they can now transform, you know, they can even transform a food's property into a beneficial way. And that's where we talk about useful functions of microorganism. Now, one of the useful functions of microorganisms is when the food properties transform into a beneficial way. Food fermentation. One of the useful functions of microorganisms, when you use the food as food supplements, the microorganisms as food supplements, um, mushroom, um, I've forgotten the name of this um, single cell proteins. Yeah, single cell proteins. All these are uh, foods produced by microorganisms that are useful. Foods are converted into beneficial cheese, yogurt. These are all products of fermentation. You know, most of our fermented food, all of the fermented food, fall under this form of transformation. But the non-beneficial aspect of the food is when the food now becomes poor. It's a loss to you as a farmer, and it can also lead to foodborne illness when such foods are eaten. Those of you that like buying cheap products, Esha, in the market, you know, broken tomato, they'll tell you no problem. Ah, just wash it and boil it and eat it. And sometimes you see already moles flying on these um Asia in the market because they are cheap we go for them well you know god has been faithful and because some of us have a very strong immune system now we don't come down with illness and we just rule that ah, there's no problem the food you are good to go so diversity of habitats um viable microorganism may be found in a very wide range of habitats you find them every the hottest springs. These are the ones that are called the extreme thermophiles. The coldest of brine ponds, if extreme sacrophiles. You find them in wastes of polar regions, you know. 
and um, actively growing bacteria occurs at temperatures in excess of over 100. Those are the extremophiles, the volcanic vents, the bottom of deeper oceans, you know, where boiling, boiling is prevented by the very high hydrostatic pressure. Microorganisms can occur in acidic waste drainage. They can occur in um, lakes, soda lakes. They can be isolated from black anaerobic salt of eustorine mold or the purest waters of biologically unproductive or oligotrophic lake. Now, we are talking about their diversity. They can be found everywhere, everywhere. They are, they are, <laughs> we can call them cosmopolitans. Now, in all this, and many other habitats. Micro, they play an important part in recycling of organic and inorganic materials through their roles in the carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur cycles. I told you that in, um, in agriculture, they play a very important role. Of course, when there is no uh, recycling or breaking down of all these um, molecules or compounds, into smaller useful ones that can be transformed into useful ones for plants as well as for animals, then we are done for. Of course, when there's no microbial degradation, even the carcasses of humans and plants will be a problem. You know, there will be a great, so they will become a great problem of pollution for us. So basically, they are found everywhere and they play important role in the maintenance of stability of biosphere. Now, the surfaces of plants, leaves, flowers, uh, and the roots, as well as the gods of animals, have a rich microflora of bacteria, yeast, and filamentous fungi. I've mentioned that earlier. And one of other parts where you find this microorganism is in the female genital tract. The vagina. You have the lactobacillus there. And that's one of the reasons why women are advised not to use medicated soap to wash their private parts. Because when you do that, you displace the habitat. You kill the lactobacillus. And the lactobacillus there is serving as a soldier, is a, is a soldier guiding that part. And you kill the soldiers, you break the edge. Now the serpent will strike, and that's why yeast will proliferate what we call candida albicans. So in my class, uh, although this is food, but I'll try to use some medical terms to explain it. So please don't come and be laughing when we call the names the way it is, and don't claim to be too religious, not to listen or, or learn from what... Um, we shall be saying in the class. Now, the natural or normal flora may affect the original quality of the raw ingredients used in the manufacturing of the foods. You know, the normal flora can be a source of contamination to the food. And this may occur during processing. It may also occur when there is possibility of food spoilage or associated illness. Now, how does that happen? The, the, the part, I mean, the organisms are actually normal flower. They are natural. They are part of the food. You want to ask, fermentation, you know, when you make, for example, let me use the normal ogi as an example. You know, when you make your ogi, you grind your corn, you sieve it, and you have your pulp. What happens the following day? You know, the more the day of stay, the, the thicker, I mean, the more concentrated, the sour taste, that's the acid that is produced. Have you ever thought of it that where is the organism responsible for this fermentation coming from? It's coming from the plant product itself. So these are natural, the organisms are natural in the, in the corn or the cereal. So they are the ones responsible for the fermentation. But because fermentation is a good 
process. Now, the organisms in fermentation, the lactic acid bacteria, the lactobacillus. So now that we know that um, microorganisms can be found everywhere, let's take their habitat one by one. Microorganisms in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is one of the most hostile environment for microorganisms. But um, in the suspended air, they, they are there as a tiny uh, microbial propago. And these propagules are subjected to desiccation, that's uh, drying, and to the damaging effect of radial energy from the sun. They are also subjected to um, chemical activity of external uh, uh, elemental gaseous oxygen to which it will be intimately exposed. So many microorganisms, especially the gram negative, they die very rapidly when they are suspended in air. Although none is able to grow and multiply in the atmosphere at a significant, uh, but a significant number of microbes are able to survive and they use the turbulence of the air as a means of um, dispersal. Why is it that the gram negative are the ones that will die rapidly? I, I want to believe that your understanding of bacteriology will tell you that the gram negative have a very thin um, peptidoglycan layer in their cell wall. And that thin peptidoglycan layer makes it easy for them, you know, to die off and that makes, makes it easy to, for them to be susceptible to most of these um, environmental conditions. While the thick cell wall in the thick peptidoglycan layer in the cell wall of the gram positive organisms, I mean, micro and um, bacteria, makes them resistant to some of these um, uh, factors. So, how do you now determine the presence in air? There are method of doing it, quantitative determination and qualitative um, determination. For the qualitative, you just want to know whether they are present or absent. For the quantitative, you want to know their exact number, the amount. So for qualitative, which you are going to do in the lab, you just expose a Petri dish that has an appropriate um, um, medium. It could be a general purpose medium that's nutrient agar. If you want to isolate bacteria, that's a general purpose agar for isolation of bacteria. Or potatoes dextrous agar, if you want to isolate fungi. Or you can also use sabrod dextrous agar. Then you can also use um, yeast extract agar for um, isolation of yeast. That's also a fungi. Now, fungi has two major sub group, which is the yeast, which is the unicellular form of fungi, and the molds, which is the multicellular form of fungi. So there are a few um, bacteria genus that are present in air. And how does this air get contaminated? You know, they can be generated from aerosol, from animals or human source, or from water. You know, aerosols are those tiny droplets. For example, when you sneeze, you know, aerosols are released. And currently, that's one of the means of contacting um, um, COVID. So you are asked to sneeze into your elbow in order to reduce the dispersal of these um, aerosols. So most times when you use the toilet and you flush, you know, in your water closet, you're supposed to cover the toilet seat. But some of us leave it open and we stand there while we flush. Now, as you are doing that, aerosols are released and you now inhale it. It settles on the floor, it settles on your hand, it settles on your cloth. And you go straight to the kitchen as a woman and you go and start cooking. What do you think you are doing? Make your food. That's one thing I should have introduced in this course. 
that we should make our food our medicine and our medicine our food and for the ladies let your kitchen be your hospital for your family and not a graveyard so examples of <laughs> Um, colonies that are found in air after these plates have been exposed and they are incubated at appropriate temperature either for 24 hours or for 48 hours you find the genus micrococci corini bacteria you find the streptomyces that's the actinomycetes family you find bacillus these are because they are for bacillus they are uh, spore formers. So their spores are actually present in these aerosols. So when they settle on a suitable medium, they grow, especially food. And they are, you know, dust, there's no way you can separate air from dust. So when dust settles on your food, so for those of you that like buying food on the roadside, especially the ones displayed by the gutter, these foods are not covered. Flies will perch on the gutter. And not pitch on the food. Mama put food akara by the roadside. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. Look at the environment where this food is being prepared and the environment where these foods are being displayed. So that will tell you the quality of what you are eating. Therefore, the fungi group, you have um, most of their conidospores, they are also present in the air, you know. And when this bacteria, when this pause settles on food as a means of being dispersed by dust particles, you know, through physical agitation, then they serve as a means of um, contamination in our food. So microorganisms in the soil, I always said the soil is uh, an environment that is extremely complex and has different um, different solid, have their own diverse flora of bacteria. No, different soil, please. Different soil have their own um, diversity of flora, of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and algae. In our uh, primary school teaching of soil, soil profile, you know, the top soil, you have different types of microorganisms because it is top at the top and it's exposed to air. You have you for in microbiology you find more of the aerobes, those organisms that will survive only in the presence of oxygen. So the deeper you go, the soil composition changes, as well as the type of bacteria and fungi that will be present in that soil. For bacteria, you find more of the anaerobes because the deeper you go the um the lesser the oxygen so you have more of carbon dioxide that deep down in the soil so you find more of the anaerobes under the the on the uh, underground now the soil is such a rich reservoir of microorganisms that it has provided many of the strains used for industrial production of antibiotics enzymes, amino acid, vitamins, and other products that are used in both pharmaceutical and food industry. And one of that major group is the actinomycetes. Those are the groups that are used for streptomycin, streptomycin, the streptomycetes. So soil microorganisms participate in recycling of organic and nitrogenous compounds with an essential, which is essential if the soil is to support the active growth of plants. The ability to degrade complex organic material makes this um, soil microorganisms, potent spoilage organisms, if they are present in food. You know, their natural habitat is the soil, but there's no way you can separate soil and food. You plant your crops, you harvest your crops. And most times when you harvest, there's no way you, you still find soil. Even ordinary vegetables, when you buy vegetables in the market, and the best thing to do is to bring it home and wash the vegetables before you die. But most of us ladies, because we are lazy, 
you ask the mama to cut it for you. So she will cut with the sand and everything. Now, the nutritionist will tell you, the moment you break into the tissues of the vegetables, nutrients are being depleted. So some of us know how to wash our vegetables very well. You wash with salt or you wash with vinegar before you cook. Because most of these, so but at the, when you wash properly, you'll find the bottom of your of that's your container, sand. And that's where the spores of most of these pathogens are. So when you cook your soup, the following day, when you come back to the kitchen to warm, you see bubbles inside your pot of soup. And when you taste it, it has gone sour. What happens? Despite the heat that was applied in the process of cooking, spore farmers. So they have germinated and they have turned into vegetative cells the following day. So um, the common practice of protecting food from death is justified in reducing the likelihood of inoculating the food with potential spoilage organisms. The soil is a very competitive environment and one in which the physical chemical parameters can change very rapidly. Yes, the parameters of the soil can change very rapidly. The kind of uh, parameters you have during the dry season is different from the parameters you have during the rainy season. So in response to this, many soil bacteria and fungi produce resistant structures, such as endospores of bacillus and clostridium, chlamydospores, and sclerotia of many fungi, which can withstand desiccation and a wide range of temperature fluctuations. So bacterial endospores are especially resistant to elevated temperatures. Their subsequent germination is frequently triggered by exposure to such temperatures and their common occurrence in soil makes this a potent source of spoilage and food poisoning coming from bacilli and clostridia. We're going to treat that under food borne diseases, food poisoning and food infection as a result of this um, genus. So microorganisms in water, we are still discussing the habitat. I just want to give us um, a, a preview, you know, into the the course before we go straight into sources of contamination. We want to know where they live before we now come to how they contaminate the, the food. Just a preview of where these microorganisms find themselves. So in aquatic environments is an area and um, is in area and in volume is the largest of the biosphere of both fresh water and the sea. And this contains many species of microorganisms adapted to this particular habitat. The sea around the coast are influenced by inputs of terrestrial and fresh water microorganisms, and more importantly, by human activity. You know, in Lagos, for example, the Lagos Lagoon, human activity, people are fishing in that lagoon, at the same time, people throw waste into that lagoon. Effluents are being discarded into that lagoon. Sewage, when they come to your house and clear your septic, they take it to that lagoon and empty it into that lagoon, thereby polluting the lagoon. Even though water has um, an ability of self-cleansing, but when the pollutant is even more than the activity of the water, then we're in trouble. Now, this same water is where the fish, the fish is harvested, and we buy and eat. Already, the fish or the seafood have become contaminated. So let's go on. The sea has become a convenient dump for sewage and other waste products. You know, even most of these um, production companies, they discharge their effluents into the sea. Although it is true that the sea have an enormous capacity to disperse such materials and render them harmless, okay, 
the scale of the act human activity has had a detrimental effect on coastal waters. You know, for example, the filtering feeding activity of shellfish. Now, shellfish, they, they feed by filtration. And this may lead to um, enteric organism in infected person. Now, the fish is infected with enteric organisms. Enteric organisms that are coming from the sewage, you know, of human fecal effluents. Now, these things have been deposited into the water bodies. And thereby you now eat this shellfish and the person can come down with either salmonella, cholera, you know, um, um, E. coli uh, infection. Fresh water may also act as a vehicle of bacterial protozoa or viruses, you know, causing disease through contamination of, I've mentioned that. Now, these organisms do not normally multiply in river and lake water. I may present in low, but nonetheless significant number, you know, making it difficult for the presence of such organism by act actually looking for a species of bacteria that is present in large number. So now when they appear in fresh water, because their presence is somehow, you know, disguised in fresh water, you may not see them in large numbers. So this fresh water, what we do in order to um, establish their presence is to carry out what is called the uh, coliform test. And you look for what is called an indicator organism. An indicator organism. And indicator organisms are organisms that are normally present in human or animal excreta. And a very good example of that is Escherichia coli. Now, Escherichia coli is used because it takes a long time for the organism to die when they are present in polluted water. And now when you find, when you screen the water, they are used as a um, water quality control, you know, test. When you find E. coli in your water, it signifies that other enteric organisms like Salmonella, Shigella, Vibro, Cholerae, um, Aeromonas will also be present in that water. So we use them as indicators. They are called a group of coliform. And under that, you have the total coliform and the fecal coliform. The fecal coliform is where the Escherichia coli belongs and then Streptococci fecalis, these are the fecal coliforms. Now, fungi are also present in both marine and fresh waters, but they do not have the same level of significance in food microbiology as other microorganisms. So they can produce very toxic metabolites, which may become concentrated in shellfish without apparently causing harm to them. But when the fish is consumed by human, it can result in what is called a paralytic shellfish poisoning. So we are still discussing habitats of um, microorganisms. We have discussed air, water, soil. Now I want to discuss humans or animal as an habitat for microorganisms at the surface of humans and animals are exposed to air, soil, and water. And there will always be the possibility of contamination of food and handling equipment and surfaces with these environmental microbes by direct contact with animal surface. Microorganisms are characteristics for each species of animal and in humans. The normal skin flora is dominated by gram-positive bacteria from the genera Staphylococcus. Now, Staphylococcus, that's the genus. Corinibacterium, Propinibacterium. These are genus of um, gram-positive bacteria that have normal flora on our skin. And, you know, it baffles me when I hear all these people selling herbs 
infertility. This stuff look like cause arrows will kill you. This stuff look like cause arrows will kill you. Infertility stuff look like cause. Low sperm count stuff look like cause. And fire stuff look like cause. This my doctor Jungo care. We treat you all. We cure you all. We did. You know, I just laugh. The, uh, uh, I'm not saying staphylococcus are not, um, the genus is not um, deadly, but there are some certain areas where, when they find themselves in areas where it's not their natural habitat, they become pathogenic, yes. But for the fact that people use that as a means of you know, defrauding people, yeah, it baffles me anyway. Let's go on. So for animals that are killed for meat, the hide may be one of the most important sources of spoilage organism. That's their skin. That's what we mean by hide. The pomon. Now the micro in poultry, the microorganisms are associated with feathers and the exposed follicles. Once the feathers are removed, may affect the microbial quality and potential shelf life of the carcass. So normally they are present on the skin, but once you remove the skin, you have broken the edge. Human skin is the largest organ of the body and their role is to protect, to defend. So the, the staph local cause is on your skin. It's just the adrenal, it's on know, enjoying itself, habitats and nutrients. But the moment the skin is broken, they move from the skin into the deeper tissues. They become pathogenic. And that's where you get type uh, weak low. You know, those of you that like eating your nails with your teeth, you create an opening for staff and they enter into it. And, you know, they start eating into the tissues. And before you know, pause. And before you know, sleepless nights. So the nose and the truth is also another habitat where you find these mm -hmm. microorganisms. With, with the mucous membrane lining the nose and the, um, the truth, the mucous membrane is supposed to be a protective covering. And lying there, they have specialized, you know, they become a specialized environment. And these environments are colonized by different group of microorganisms. They are usually harmless, but may have the potential to cause disease, especially following extreme temperature, starvation, when the person is not able to feed properly. And that's why they say, it's not about eating, it's about eating balanced diet. So that balance diet will boost your immune system and it will make your uh, the normal flora in that place to be active, to be able to combat any invading um, microorganisms. They are, act as soldiers defending our immune system. Overcrowding or other stress, which lower the resistance of the host and make the spread of disease more likely in both human and other animals. And you do uh, I'm sure you've done, okay, that's in your HND2, immunology, you understand more of this, how these factors affect overcrowding, starvation, stress, how these factors affect, you know, the uh, immunity of the host. So basically in the human nose, you find more of the Staphylococcus aureus. The larger percentage of human population carry this strain. And this strain, this aureus, produce this species, sorry, produce a powerful toxin that is capable of eliciting a vomiting response. So now they are found in the nose as normal flora. As children, we used to pick our nose and lick the kata. Those don't form any uh, big boy or big girl now. We all did it, eh? you know. But this same stuff, when they now find themselves in habitats aside the nose or the skin, they release toxins. And uh, when they find themselves in food, they release toxins. 
and that leads to food poisoning. So what do we mean by food contamination? It's a state of being of food being impure or unfit for use. And when um, there's an introduction of undesirable elements in the food, then that food becomes what contaminated. It can be contaminated by insects, rodents, chemicals, microbes, other foreign particles, and lots of more, uh, lots of uh, ETC. No, the substances added may or may not cause problems. So well, that brings us to the three types of contamination, the physical contamination, chemical contaminants, and the biological or microbial contaminants. For physical contaminants, they, are, they do not change or damage the food. You know, they are physical. You can see them and you can actually sort them. They do not, they will not spoil food, but they can cause injury if that food is swallowed. And such food, such as the examples of such things are insects, parts, rodents, parts, or rodent excreta. When you find the excreta of rats in your gari, you will remove it and you will see it soak the gari. But how will you remove the wee wee of rats from your food? So broken parts of insects the eggs of insects, you know, you find the larva of insects, packaging materials, you find that some of these packaging materials are contaminated with different types of things. Sometimes when you um, check bottles, plastics, you find decks, you find different uh, broken parts. Now you can, this can be removed. So the two types of problem that arise from this is when large volume of that food is eaten, you know, or what they do, they destroy the food. The insects may destroy the food when you have your uh, yam in your stubborn or rice or beans and weevils eat them up. They are destroying the food. The food is no longer useful for you. Weevil infested beans, you throw them away. So they cause waste. Then the microbes that may enter the food, like flies, you know, the airy feet of flies, they perch on um, maybe septic or sewage that is not properly maintained. They now come and perch on your food. The body of the insects carry, you know, when flies perch on our food or when rats, you know, eat part of our food and even climb on the food and People still remove the parts that the rat have eaten. Um, what do you do? You mold the herb very well, pour hot soup on it, and you are good to go. You understand? So most of these insects may enter the food during production, during growth of the food. And you sometimes you find eggs of parasites, of insects in weeds farm, you know, uh, in processing environment. That takes us to contaminants, I mean, chemical contaminants. We are trying to keep insects and other uh, pests under control. This can lead to chemical contamination. You know, the insecticides, there are chemicals that are used to improve the yield, you know, of pro food products, of plants, so due to insect infestation. Herbicides are also used to control weeds. Now, but these pests, these pesticides or these herbicides now leave a residue in the food. And when these residues are eaten over time, they become a source of chemical contaminants in humans. And, you know, that's a, it poses a major health hazard. We have had incidents of lead poisoning in water, you know, as a result of the miners in the north, somewhere in Zamfara State, we've had issues of traders adding um, sniper to beans so that their beans will not get infested with weevil, you know. But when this sniper infested be, um, 
beings are eaten by humans. What happens? Food poisoning. Then the group of um, chemicals called the PBCs, they are among the most toxic substances. And this gets into water supplies. Chloroform, benzene, lead, you know, polychlorinated um, biphenols. These contaminants get into our food, get into our water. You know, when it rains and these fields are actually being treated with pesticide, the, the rainwater will actually be washed either into our wells, into our rivers, you know, into our boreholes, and thereby coming back to us when we drink this water. Then the microbial contaminants, you know, as a result of microorganisms in the food. These microorganisms, they cause food spoilage. And when they are not properly taken care of, and this food is eaten by man, they can lead to foodborne diseases.